Here we are suiting up at the Kennedy Space Center for our launch on June 20th. Again, Kevin Kriegel, the uh, pilot, waving to his family. Jean-Jacques Favier from France, who's very eager to get into space. <laughs> Susan Helms, all pressure checked and ready to begin her third space flight. And the alien here is uh, Dr. Rick Lenahan, our veterinarian. And Dr. Chuck Brady, also eager to get into space for his first time. And from Canada, Dr. Bob Thirsk. The launch uh, morning schedule is quite quick paced. No sooner had we suited up when it was time to head out to uh, the launch pad and uh, the van would take us out there. During this walkout, we were thrilled to see some of our friends and, and colleagues who had gotten up early that morning to wish us all well as we were heading off on our mission. And waiting for us at the launch pad was our beloved Columbia. And uh, at this point, it seemed like it was a living creature as it hissed and fumed and groaned. And it seemed as eager as we were to, to get ready for the launch. The crew uh, was greeted at the launch pad on the, on the gantry by the, the closeout crew who helped us put on our harnesses and our parachutes and check out our, our equipment before we got inside Columbia. The strapping in procedure uh, is a, quite a busy and highly choreographed affair and uh, it's also a bit of a, an emotional affair as, as well and for first time flyers such as myself, I found that my thoughts uh, went to friends and, and family, to the emergency procedures that I was gonna have to uh, perform in the event of an emergency, and about this wonderful adventure I was heading off on. It was really nice for me to strap in in the mid-deck the same time that Tom Hendricks, uh, a three-time flyer, was strapping in the flight deck. If Tom thought this was a safe thing to do, then I thought it was as well. <laughs> and these wonderful views you have of the strapping in procedure are courtesy of a, a mini portable camcorder. It's just absolutely fantastic to see the be in space and see this great piece of American technology come off the external tank. Uh, it was really difficult for Rick and I to focus on getting uh, pictures of this because here we saw the earth and land masses and the oceans floating beneath us. But uh, the external tank uh, just did a super job and uh, would perform greatly. This is a, a mission that had dual objectives. It was a microgravity mission and a life science mission combined together, but the the focus of the very first day, right after we got into space, was to capture the life science uh, data for documenting the adaption process. So without any further ado, as soon as we desuited, people were working on experiments, which is probably a, a first in the shuttle program as quickly as we did. Here you see Bob on one of our life science facilities. 
It's a dynamometer, and uh, what it's meant to do is help measure both the static and dynamic performance of the musculoskeletal system. Uh, we had several PI investigative teams that were part of this major experiment, and uh, here you see some of the activities taking place. Yeah, that's uh, me strapped into the TVD now being electrically stimulated involuntarily by a device <laughs> which uh, measures muscle contraction. Here's Chuck on the arm uh, lever, and uh, we're measuring torque output and muscle strength uh, and degradation over the 17 days of the flight on the uh, torque velocity uh, dynamometer. And Chuck here is uh, going through the different uh, protocols. You can see the IBM ThinkPad up there on his right hand, and uh, he's following those, and that interfaces with software in the TVD. Jean-Jacques is uh, holding a hand grip dynamometer, and he is performing various protocols uh, that he is reading on the ThinkPad screen up there in front of him. And uh, they are anywhere from following torque curves to uh, producing various contractions anywhere from 10 to 100% on the hand grip. And all this uh, will be compared to uh, ground-based data when we get back, when we are back now, actually, and uh, look at changes in muscle physiology. That's me again, and I'm on ALFI, the uh, astronaut lung function experiment. And I'm about to uh, get on there and uh, start uh, blowing into this tube, and it's measuring gaseous exchange in the lungs, and we're comparing uh, pulmonary physiology on orbit uh, to ground-based studies. And right there, I'm interfacing with the uh, keyboard unit and reading the uh, LEDs and uh, following the flow, the uh, flow parameters up there on the screen. And also, uh, we used ALFI uh, with exercise. Uh, we did uh, resting PFTs. Uh, here's a picture of Jean-Jacques with as many watches on and uh, the uh, magic mask, and he has just gotten off the ergometer, and he's going on to ALFI right now to uh, determine if there are any changes uh, pre- and uh, post-exercise. Here's Chuck with the Olympic torch, and uh, <laughs> Chuck is hooked up to uh, ALFI and the ergometer right now simultaneously performing the exercises, and it's uh, measuring his pulmonary output. And here's the rest of the crew offering uh, the, to cheer Chuck on and share in the Olympic moment with the torch. <laughs> Now, uh, that torch was later taken down by the orbiter crew and walked around the orbiter after we landed. We had uh, another study. It was not relative to the lung function or the musculoskeletal studies that we have already talked about, but we also were looking at the vestibular system, the neurovestibular system. Uh, specifically on this experiment, the, the goal here is to try to capture what happens to eye and head movements and posture movements when the inner ear becomes confused about what's up and what's down. Without the effect of gravity, your inner ear doesn't really understand uh, which way it's heading relative to the earth. And so when you remove that effect, the question is, how does the inner ear then translate to the eyes and head how to move? And so we had a number of experiments. You can see some of them in progress here where we were doing very disciplined head and eye movements. And uh, likewise, we did eye movements with and without uh, knowledge of what was going on in the immediate environment, and by comparing this relative to what was captured pre- and post-flight, uh, we hope to better understand how that whole inner ear, eye, postural integrated system works together. And of course, an application for this is, among other things, the study of space motion sickness, because we know that that's got an influence on how people react in space to that effect. The award for the uh, oddest looking LMS experiment goes to the torso rotation experiment. Uh, this uh, investigation also measures how the vestibular apparatus or our inner ear uh, adapts to the weightless environment. We also hope to come up with a, a cause for this space motion sickness problem, which afflicts about half of all astronauts during the first two or three days of space flight. Here in the mid deck, uh, Jean Jacques and I have just donned uh, the equipment, which includes accelerometer packages on the top of our head and also on our back, and we're performing a a strange looking dance which is actually important to calibrate uh, the equipment. Uh, since it's the only experiment on our flight that comes from Canada, I thought it appropriate on one of the data collection days to wear my Team Canada hockey jersey. We hope also that uh, the results of this experiment will help improve treatment programs for people that suffer from motion sickness in settings on the ground. Well, this is the lace and sleepwear here. Uh, you're seeing uh, four of us come out of our bunks in the morning. This is a study looking at the circadian rhythms and sleep patterns. And this is the first time that astronauts were actually had their brain waves measured at night during six nights on four subjects. Uh, and you see us coming out of there. We're really a fashion statement here, as you'll see in just a moment. But uh, Tom's getting us all up, and we're going to line up here in just a second with all our sleep uh, equipment on. We think we're going to get really great data from this. We're looking at long-duration space flight, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, help people rest better and be more efficient, both in space and here on the ground. Of course, it's uh, also important to try and quantify the changes in performance. And on this flight, we flew a small laptop computer, 
which we would uh, practice with a few times before flight, during flight, and then post-flight, and we could see the changes in our memory capabilities and in our hand-eye coordination. This mission was a life science mission, but also a microgravity science mission. And uh, we had uh, several uh, fields of investigations, including uh, fluid physics. Here we see the uh, fluid uh, physics um, experiment called the BDPU for uh, bubble drop and particle unit. Uh, each uh, PI had a special container to be ahead to load in this uh, uh, optical bench, and uh, we had to make uh, some uh, uh, critical uh, optimization before uh, getting the hand to, uh, to the ground and to the PI. These experiments worked very well, except one day we had a little problem that Kevin and myself uh, and Susan are trying to fix, uh, a shortcut in the, uh, in the um, uh, connector. But uh, when we uh, got that fixed, uh, we were able to get very nice uh, views of uh, boiling in this uh, particular experiment or uh, convection driven by uh, capillary forces like uh, for this bubble in another experiment. And we tried to get the best uh, quiet conditions for these critical phases. Another important experiment was a material science uh, project, uh, a furnace in which we uh, elaborated different kind of uh, specimens, uh, alloy, uh, aluminum alloy, for instance, as well as semiconductors. So we tried to get the best environment, uh, thermal environment, to uh, study the kind of structure we can expect to get in space. And as you can see here, uh, sometimes it's uh, easier to work upside down to uh, get uh, accurate uh, positioning of uh, the uh, cartridge inside the furnace. And uh, Susan uh, looked very comfortable doing that. You can see that the Space Lab is very busy with activities and a lot of experiments. We also were doing some uh, experiments on the flight deck. This is the voice command system. It's a voice activated system for the payload bay cameras. And Tom and myself were working on this experiment and just seeing how well it uh, performed on orbit. Uh, we also got great views of outside the Earth. Uh, we had a full moon and it was uh, setting as it sets and goes through the atmosphere. It actually uh, turned blue. So we had a blue moon and on orbit we had a real blue moon which is a second full moon in a, in a month. We thought we'd be fairly clever and, and uh, we uh, videoed this down to Mission Control Center but they were on top of us and they had the song to play when we were videoing this down. One of our best passes was early in the morning. Uh, we had a nice pass uh, above uh, the Mediterranean Sea, uh, Europe and uh, Spain here. Uh, we were able to see uh, our hometowns. Uh, this one was uh, Spain and Madrid, a hometown of uh, Pedro Duque, uh, our uh, alternate. Then we had uh, some of these beautiful islands uh, south of the uh, coast of France that we uh, saw uh, sometimes and it was not so cloudy. And uh, we continued uh, above uh, Italy uh, and Greece and it was a very uh, nice award in the morning to wake up early just to see that. We also had some uh, marvelous passes over the United States. Uh, you may recall that during the end of June, it was absolutely clear over most of uh, North America. And this is one scene here of us uh, saying goodbye to California, uh, currently over Nevada, New Mexico. There's Lake Mead uh, near Las Vegas, nearly in the center of the picture. And uh, one of the current events that happened while we were on orbit were the wildfires in the Grand Canyon area. And you can actually see those in the bottom left of the picture at this time. Uh, coming into the field of view just before we head over into Mexico on this particular pass. So as you can see, it was quite impressive from space. It's absolutely fantastic to travel from 39 degrees north to 39 degrees south. And uh, this is a view of the Appalachians, the Great Smoky Mountains from Tennessee to North Carolina. Now we're getting ready to come home. I don't think anyone's wanted to come home, but this is a view inside as we're preparing for entry. And as a rookie, I can't begin to tell you just what a spectacular light show it was. I was really glad there were three veterans on the flight deck with me because I felt like the whole front end of the orbiter was coming on fire. As you can see, looking out the back, there's just awesome uh, light show that's going on. 
And in just a second, we'll see uh, the lights reflecting off of Tom and uh, Kevin in front and illuminating fully uh, in a darkened cabin Susan's face here. Just an absolutely spectacular show as we reached entry. You saw videos of the launch, but we also had that small camera where videos out uh, the front uh, were over the uh, panhandle of Florida. If you look in the middle of the picture, it's kind of cloudy, but you can actually see the coast of the Fort Walton Beach, Pensacola area as we come to land at the Kennedy Space Center. It was an overcast day. We had uh, clouds at about 20,000 feet. We're at the heading alignment cone. Uh, Tom's in a right-hand turn, uh, trying to line up on Kennedy Space Center runway 33. We go uh, through the clouds, and this is looking out my window. This is what I saw on the entry day. We can see the rivers of the Kennedy Space Center as we make the turn. Uh, coming around the, the heading alignment cone, we're doing about 300 miles per hour and we roll out about six miles from the runway at 12,000 feet, pointing 20 degrees nose low. Fairly steep approach. Tom's lined up right on the numbers uh, for our landing there on that morning a couple of weeks ago. Of course, the entry flight control team had gotten us uh, to this point with a great effort by some of the folks here in the room with us today. Here we are at 2,000 feet, beginning the uh, gentle pullout from that steep uh, dive to approach the runway using the lights to the left of the runway to achieve a one and a half degree approach. Kevin puts the wheels down about 10 seconds before touchdown and the airspeed is bleeding from about 300 knots down to a target of 205 at touchdown. And we're uh, intending to touch down about here on the black marks. You can see that's uh, about where we touched down. So the numbers worked out well. Uh, the pre-planned numbers at 195. Kevin pushes two buttons, which deploys the drag chute. I lower the nose to the runway. And then we can use the nose wheel steering system on the orbiter, much like an airliner, to uh, track the center line, which you see here. It also has brakes like an airliner, so we're slowing it with the brakes at uh, about 60 knots. Kevin punches another button, which releases the drag chute so it doesn't drape down over the engines after we stop. And we continue braking until we come to a complete stop. And that's the end of the flight portion of the mission but some of the most crucial data still had to be collected as these four payload crew members readapted to gravity. So we very efficiently, with the help of the folks here in Mission Control, egressed the vehicle, they began their data takes, and I think you can see from this that uh, we were very pleased with the 17-day flight. 